We are. We are. We are cultivate. 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 We are cultivate. Hello and welcome to a special mini-sode of Yield Crime, the show where Maddie and I discuss the funny, strange, and obscure crimes of yesteryear every Wednesday. This special bi-weekly segment is called Can You Crack the Cramp Word, which is slang for a difficult or obscure term, which I thought was very fitting. And joining me today is Jordan Morris, a comedy writer with experience writing in TV, features, comics, podcast, digital comedy, and video games. And before we begin, I'd like to give him the opportunity to tell us a little more about himself. Welcome, Jordan. Hi, it's great to be here. Can't wait to hear these cramp words. <laughs> Very excited. Can't wait to get to it. Yeah, hi, I'm Jordan Morris. I co-host a podcast called Jordan Jesse Go with Jesse Thorne of NPR. I'm also a comedy writer. I've done a lot of work in late night comedy and animation. And recently I've been writing comic books. My first graphic novel, Bubble, that I co-wrote with Sarah Morgan and has art from the great Tony Cliff. That came out in 2018. We got nominated for two Eisners. That is still out there. It is a sci-fi comedy with a lot of, you know, blood and guts and monsters and swearing. Nice. It's for grown-ups. But my newest one that's due out later this year is called Youth Group. It is a YA horror comedy, a little lighter on the swears, a little lighter on the blood and guts, but it's still a ton of fun. Hopefully, something for, you know, something you could give to a teen and not be too worried that they're going to be, you know, scandalized. Yeah, the arts from the great Bowen McGurdy. It is a horror comedy about uh, teenage exorcists. I grew up in kind of a goofy Bible study when I was a kid and always kind of liked, liked that world of, you know, cool youth pastors who, you know, sit backwards (laughs) on the chair and you know, tell you about a pretty cool guy named JC who knows what modern teens are going through. I really liked that world and always wanted to kind of set a story there. So Bowen and I did this book, Youth Group, and yeah, it's coming out this year. Pre-order yours now. Awesome. Yeah, I I got to read a copy of it. And within like the first couple pages where he's talking, the youth pastor, not the youth pastor, but the, the pastor pastor is talking about the Pina Colada song. And he's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> but do you, but do you know that it's really about escape? And then like all the, the parents are going like, ah, like going wild. And I was like, oh my right. God, I know where I'm at. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I know what I'm getting into. <laughs> I always like it when the cool pastor tries to bring in like a piece of pop culture and, you know, like, you know, Luke Skywalker was a bit of a Christ figure himself. I always liked that yeah. move. So, yeah, <laughs> I think, yes, in our book, the pastor tries to give you the biblical significance of the Pina Colada song. Yes. As soon as I read that, I was like, yes. All right. Yes, yes. <laughs> I love it. As you mentioned in your intro, you have two podcasts. Do you still do Bubble or no, not really? Yeah, so Bubble was a, you know, was kind of a mini series. It was a scripted mini series for the Maximum Fun Network. And yeah, it was a sci fi comedy uh, about a, a not so distant future where people live in domed cities. And every one of these domed cities has kind of a theme. So if you wanted to live in the hipster bubble, you could. If you wanted to live in the suburban bubble, you could. Yeah, there's a, a bubble for every vibe. And kind of in this world, there's a bunch of monsters on the outside and dubious corporate conspiracy going on. That was the scripted podcast for Max Fun. Still up there. Nine episodes, I believe, you can grab. And yeah, we turned it into a graphic novel. So that graphic novel is also available. So you can ingest the bubble story in any way you'd like, as long as one of those ways, those ways are either podcasts or comics. And did I see on your website that it's possibly being turned into like an actual featured film? Yeah, yeah. We're developing the feature film of Bubble with a bunch of cool folks, including Point Grey, that uh, Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg's company, and the good folks at Sony Animation. So uh, yeah, work on that continues as we speak. That's really awesome. 
Yeah, totally. Us. I know it's it's been a very exciting project. Yeah, very excited that the the bubble resonated with people in that way. And yeah, I've been really really proud of every, every iteration we've done so far. So um, yeah, excited for more bubble stories in the future. So you mentioned Jordan Jesse Go. For listeners that may be unfamiliar, can you tell us a little bit more about that podcast? Yeah, so this is a just down the middle ass chat podcast that I do with uh, <laughs> Jesse Thorne. Um, you might know him as a host on NPR. He's also the co-host of the Judge John Hodgman podcast. And yeah, we were we were college buddies. He was my RA, and we were on the college improv team together. And uh, we did a college radio show together. So we would just you know get up at. 5 a.m. and walk to the college radio station and, you know, goof around for an hour Nice for what I'm sure was four people listening. (laughs) Yeah, but we really liked doing it. And it was, you know, a big, you know, just a big part of our college experience. So when um, we graduated and and kind of moved to L.A. to start doing, you know, kind of entertainment stuff, he was like, we should do our old college radio show as a podcast, which was something I had never heard of. It was a very young medium back then. So, yeah, we just started kind of like – goofing around every week and folded in guests who we were kind of meeting from the world of comedy. And yeah, 15 years later, we're still doing it. Still just kind of like shoot the shit and try and make each other laugh every week and have really cool guests. And, uh, you know, it's, it's still cruising. It's, it's a very like old fashioned format, you know, like yeah. obviously you have a very specific format, you know, and and a, and a fun way for fans to find the show. But yeah, <laughs> we're, we're very podcast 1.0. It, it feels a little bit silly to still be doing that all these years later, but we have a lot of fun and we have a nice, nice, nice little fan base who likes to listen to us goof around for some reason. So we're happy to do it for them. That's awesome. 15 years. That seems so crazy that like, yeah, I might be. I might even, might even be a little bit more than that. I'll have to. I'll have to to check my math and send you an update. But yeah. <laughs> so we've already touched on a little bit two graphic novels, the adaptation of Bubble, but your new one, Youth Group. You kind of touched on it a little bit. Like, can you tell us a little bit more about like the main characters of the graphic novel, or what kind of inspired you to bridge your experience with the paranormal? Shall we say? Yeah, you got it. So as I mentioned, like I I was part of one of these Bible studies and always kind of thought it was a funny, weird little world that like, you know, they never seem to get right in pop culture. Like Mm -hmm. it seems like you see kind of like goofy Christian kids in pop culture, but, you know, they're a little one dimensional. They're kind of punchlines. And yeah, it, it never seemed to be anything that people, you know, wrote about with any you know, knowledge or affection, you know? Yes. And yeah, and always kind of was sitting in my brain is like, this might be a good setting for a story. And then I remember a couple years ago, I saw a little, like a news report or something like that, that exorcisms were up, like in, you know, 2016 or 2017 or whatever, (laughs) people were still just doing exorcisms. And uh, there was a kind of an accompanying video of these kids who just looked like normal high school youth group kids, like the ones I grew mm-hmm. up with, doing an exorcism in a Starbucks parking lot or like on the uh, on like the little outdoor patio near Starbucks. They're just doing nice. an exorcism on their friend. They're just chanting in Latin, speaking in tongues. It, it, it was really, really crazy. So that kind of like that idea of like a modern person doing an exorcism kind of meshed in my brain with, you know, this idea that I wanted to write about youth groups. And yeah, that's kind of the like germ of the story. I was like, okay, what if these goofballs that I grew up with and did song yep. parodies with and went to church camp with, what if they just actually had to, you know, fight demons? And yeah, that was kind of the germ of the idea. And I kind of, uh, you know, filled it out from there with characters that I knew growing up. I think our main character is Kay, and she is someone whose parents are forcing them to go to the youth group, which is a type that like- yeah. I think if you've ever been to one of these, you know, you either met this kid or were this kid. This like, yeah, all right, I like my mom found weed in my drawer. So now I have to go to youth group and (laughs) I hate these dorks. I hate being here. But or, you know, some kind of bargain like, you know, I think with Kay, it's like her mom says you can apply to colleges on the East Coast, but you have to go to this youth group. So, yeah. So I think our, you know, our, our main character is someone who is kind of skeptical of this you know, a non-believer, and yeah, someone who is really shocked to learn that there are, 
you know, demons and monsters and, you know, yep. exorcisms going on right under her nose. Yeah. So she gets kind of folded into this world of demon fighters and, yeah, has to, you know, kind of has to come to grips with, like, what she believes and what kind of group she wants to be a part of and, you know, kind of who she wants yep. to be moving forward. And, yeah, it's, it's a little bit of a, you know, and it's taking place her senior year of high school. So she's kind of at a pivot point. What do I want to do going forward? Like, yep. Who do I want to be? And yeah, so so they kind of, her and her youth group buddies kind of get caught up in this, you know, demonic war. You know, it's funny, but there's also some chills and thrills and yeah. a little bit of romance and, yep. you know, the power of friendship, all that stuff. Definitely. It's like a really fun coming of age type of story. It's got like a, a unique twist, you know, to like learning about yourself and like what you're capable of and all this kind of thing, so. It was really fun. It was a really fun read. I really enjoyed it. Oh, good. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I'm glad you checked it out. Glad you liked it. And yeah, I'm really excited for, for people to see it. Bowen, who did all the art, is a gosh darn genius. Really just like, you know, their characters are so expressive. And, you know, their sense of comedy is so fantastic. Yeah, I should say, if you're a comics reader, you might know their series Spectre Inspectors, which is kind of a uh, another kind of YA horror comedy book and they've done a little work for marvel too so maybe you've you've seen their work on marvel comics so yeah bowen was just like a thrill to work with and yeah and i think they did such a great job with the characters and really brought them to life in a cool way yeah i would agree like it was really fun how you could take the medium of print media and be able to really kind of show these expressions and the emotions that these characters are feeling in like a really fun but not like overly campy way but in like a very like I know exactly how this person is feeling type of way. Yeah. It has a really good mix of you feel for the main character because you know this character going through it before. So that's always like a, a hard thing to deal with. And then like being kind of pigeonholed into this like, hey, you're forced to be part of this huge group that you really don't want to be part of. You know, what are you going right. to get out of this? And then it ends up becoming this like amazing thing. And yeah, it was just a really fun read. I like devoured it in like one sitting. Oh, good. Oh, cool. That's great to hear. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I love that. Love. I, I know. I, that's something I like about graphic novels. You can kind of knock out a story in a day. And, and yeah, it's always nice to hear that it's that it's something people people don't want to put down. So, yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. I have a fun question for you. In diving down deep in your website, I saw that you have written for a recurring character on a show that we watch very often in my house, Good and Fickle Morning. Oh, yeah. That's like the show we watch when we're having dinner every night. Oh, that's awesome. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Love, yeah. love, love GMM. Love Rhett and Link. Can you please enlighten our listeners on who Cotton Candy Randy is? Oh, <laughs> sure. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, yeah. Good Mythical Morning, a great YouTube show starring Rhett and Link. They, yeah, do goofy challenges. They eat weird stuff. They create insane songs. Love those guys. The most fun you can have on YouTube. Good Mythical Morning. Yeah, so I was a writer in their writer's room for a while. And while I was there, got asked to do a bit for National Cotton Candy Day. And it's one of those, just those weird things that like, yeah, I feel like happened on Twitter a lot in the early days. They're like, yeah. it's, you know, it's National Croissant Day. Yep. National Car Wash Day. And it's like, where do these things come from? Anyway, exactly. <laughs> it was National Cotton Candy Day. And I think the pitch was that there was a like Santa for National Cotton Candy Day. And he was like, you know, and his beard and stuff was made of cotton candy. And he would just be really like gross and off putting. It's like a low rent Santa. Yeah. So they just kind of like, and you know, if you, if you watch Good Mythical Morning, you know that like there's a real like, Everybody pitch in. Let's put on a show. There's a that yep. that's kind of their ethos. So, you know, people who work in the kitchen are on camera, people who work behind the scenes are on camera, just anybody who's around, they'll throw a costume on them and, you know, shove them on camera. So that's kind of what they did for me. Yeah, and I, you know, just did a voice for this guy that there was a caterer we had who kind of had a weird voice. There was a caterer who would always be like you know, he'd be like, oh, you have a lovely lemon chicken today, everybody. Oh, yeah, make sure you get these mashed potatoes. They're really great. And we would just kind of, we liked that guy's weird voice and would just like, you know, try and make each other laugh in the office by making that guy say really dark things like, oh, we have a lovely lemon chicken today. My wife won't let me see our kids. And <laughs> that was just kind of, and I was like, oh, I'll do, when I come out and do the cotton candy guy, I'll just do the caterer's voice and try and just, just to try and like make the other people on, you know behind the scenes laugh 
so yeah, I just like that was the like first time we did it, and it was you know mostly a hit. I think there's some people who don't like it, <laughs> who think it's creepy and weird, but that's a I think a valid criticism. But yeah, but I think a lot of people liked it. Uh, I think the you know uh, the hosts and the crew really liked it. So yeah, here we are, <laughs> ten ten years later, and I'm still doing Cotton Candy Randy. It's 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 tons <laughs> of fun. I always love goofing around with them. It's such a fun crew and such a fun like fan base. So yeah, I'm uh, you know you can still see. Cotton Candy Randy in a mythical video to this day. He is one of my favorite bit characters. So I saw that. I was like, oh, my God. Cotton Candy Randy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's fun. You know, he's on T-shirts. People have tattoos of Cotton Candy Randy. It's wild. <laughs> it's so crazy. I know, yeah. I'm not really, I like, I don't really do a lot of, like, acting these days. So, yeah, it's fun to do something like that that's kind of, like, sketch comedy and character-y. And tons of fun. Yeah. Well, that is all the interview-esque questions that I yes. have for you. So are you ready to try your hand at some Victorian slang? Cannot wait. Let's do it. Okay. Your first term is loof faker, and I can use it in a sentence. Would you please? All right. Being employed as a loof faker was dangerous but honest work. Okay. Can you spell it for me? Loof is L-O-O-F. And faker is as in like somebody who fakes things. Okay. So like faker. Oh boy. Okay. So it's dangerous work. Boy, everything was dangerous back in the Victorian times, wasn't it? Like <laughs> oh, I know. Breathing like was would... dangerous in the Victorian era. Yeah, right? Like, you know, you could go insane for being a hat maker, right? If you're Exactly. If you, got, you, you got too much mercury in your brain, you went insane. So may... so I guess it being dangerous doesn't help me a lot. Yeah, it's like I'm sure there was a way to die being a baker or something. Let's think. Loof. Loof faker. You know, the word sounds a little German. Not that that helps me. I'm just stalling. I'm <laughs> spinning my wheels. Okay, here's what I think it was. I think a loof faker was someone who did medical exams without training. I think it was someone who, you know, just put out a sign, said they were a doctor, and took people's money. And, you know, you could just do that back then. And, you know, oftentimes they would be found out and thrown in jail for practicing medicine without a license. Loof faker. That is a really good guess. Thank you. A loof faker was a chimney sweep. Oh! Oh my... Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. And I'm sure that was dangerous. You probably get caught in the chimney. Maybe you get soot poisoning, ash poisoning. Yeah, there was a reason they had so many kids do it, just because they would get stuck oh, in gosh, like the yeah, chimneys. Right. <laughs> and I was like, oh, God. And it was first introduced in 1859 as a slang term. Do you know like what the etymology of that is? I tried looking it up because sometimes they're like there and sometimes they're not. But this one right. was just, it just said that it was introduced in London as okay. slang. Yeah, maybe it's a Cockney rhyming slang thing. Yeah, yeah. That, that stuff's always kind of hard to figure out. Yeah, sure, okay. So your second term, this is your final term, is turkey merchants. Turkey merchants, okay, all right. So I'm guessing it's, uh, just talking it out here, I'm guessing it is not someone who sells turkeys. This is, this is a slang quiz. <laughs> well, that would be a weird just left turn if it... <laughs> <laughs> I'd feel very bamboozled if that was the case. Okay, turkey merchant. So, yeah, I mean, I think I keep going back to, like, scams, you know, so maybe someone who sells a fake something, someone who pretends to be some. I am going to guess a turkey merchant. It, oh, you know what? Never mind. I'm pivoting. I think... <laughs> It is a slang term for, like, a sex worker. Like, maybe, you know, uh, get a load of the feathers on that turkey, or I'd sure like a bite of that Christmas turkey. You know, yeah, something. Okay, yeah, that's that's my guess. I'm I'm guessing it is a slang term for a, a sex worker, street walker, uh, lady of the night type, type figure. How angry are you going to be when I tell you that you had it right the first time? Oh, no. What was it? <laughs> so a turkey merchant is someone who deals in plundered or contraband silk. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. All right. I was on the right track. That comes from- I Always go with your gut. An 1884 
the slang dictionary. Okay. So it was a term for dealers in plundered or contraband silk. But previously, it referred to something more obvious, a person who drove turkeys and geese to market. <laughs> that's oh i wonder how that i wonder how those two got conflated is it a thing where like you know they were selling turkeys but like in the back you could get the silk you know it's and if you can yeah. like order like oh i'll take a you know five pound butter ball and that was slang for like show me the plundered silks exactly well thank you thank oh my gosh those are great i'm gonna try and work those into conversation today <laughs> there you go I would like to thank Jordan for joining me today for Can You Crack the Cramp Word? And before we go, can you tell our listeners where they can find you on social media and when your new graphic novel comes out? Yes, absolutely. Uh, Social media, at Jordan underscore Morris over there on Twitter. Jordan David Morris on Instagram. The chat podcast I mentioned, Jordan Jesse Go. We're over there at MaximumFun.org. And uh, yeah, Youth Group, the YA horror comedy with the great Bowen McGurdy. Comes out this summer. It comes out in July, but pre-orders are up now. You know, if you have an author in your life, you know how important those pre-orders are. For for some some reason or another, those pre-orders really, really help books. So if you like the idea, if you if if you like the premise, if it sounds like something you would enjoy, head on over to Amazon, Barnes and Noble, or your local indie bookstore and pre-order up Youth Group. It'll be like a little present to get your future self. Come in the mail, or you'll get that call from the bookstore, and you'll be like, "Oh yes, I forgot that I ordered that." Youth Group. I'm excited for folks to check it out. Yeah, it'll be a fun summer surprise. There you go, a summer surprise, which might be a, some Victorian slang, right? A summer surprise. There you go, like summer surprise. That's the some sexy horrible part. disease. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's, it's either a yes, it's either a sex term or a kind of whooping cough type disease. Yeah, debilitating illness. <laughs> of course, yes. <laughs> well, on that note, as always, I'm Lindsay, and I'll see you next time with another tale as old as crime.